Hello and welcome to Travels Through Time. In each episode of this podcast, we invite a special guest to take us on a tailored tour of the past. Travels Through Time is brought to you in partnership with History Today, Britain's best loved serious history magazine. You can read articles relating to this podcast and more about our guests at historytoday.com forward slash travels. There is also a special subscription offer for Travels Through Time listeners. Three issues for just one pound each. If you could travel back through time, where would you go? What would you like to experience? What would you like to find out? My name is Peter Moore, and over the next half hour, I'm going to be putting these questions to our time travelling guest so they can take us on a tailored tour of the past. Today's guest, or time traveller, is the Australian historian Dr Kate Fulliger. Kate is a historian of the 18th century world with a specialism in the British Empire and the many indigenous societies the British were encountering at that time. She lectures at Macquarie University in Sydney. Welcome to Travels Through Time, Kate. Thanks, Peter. So soon you're going to be ready to begin your journey. But before you do, it's important that I map out the terms of your travel. You're going to have to stick to the following rules. You cannot interfere with the history or to participate directly in events. You are to be a silent witness, the cloaked figure in the corner, peering in, watching, eavesdropping, if you like, but nothing more. You get to choose your historical moment, and within that year, you can travel to three different scenes. Now, you picked a pretty eventful year, mm-hmm. 1776. Why does 1776 appeal so strongly to you? It sort of becomes in the middle of a book that I've just finished writing, 1776. Now, obviously, that's a, it's a hugely significant year for Americans. It seemed to be the, the main year of the American Revolution. But I am particularly interested in what that year signified for other people. So my first scene is 1776, about six months after the Declaration of Independence in London. And what were British people thinking about this momentous declaration that had occurred across the Atlantic? So do you think the mood of 1776, how would it have been present in Britain, for example? It's December 1776, so the war's been going on for a good year year, um, year and a half. And although the British had had some victories by now, they knew that that they were at least in for the long haul, if not, you know, they they didn't realise the tide was turning quite against them yet. But they knew that this was another big epic war. Through the 18th century, British people had got used to big, long, epic wars. They were not prepared to have a war with what they believed was their own kind just across the Atlantic. A lot of very significant political pamphlets coming out um, by people like Edmund Burke, Samuel Johnson, arguing about what it meant to go to war with your own people. Exactly. And that's an important point because it was really a civil war in a way. And we don't think yeah. about it in, in those terms often. We think about it as a war between two separate nations, but it was really one one country, if we can call it that. Yes, I think that's right. I think there's there's no certainty on either side of the Atlantic which way the war would go by late 1776. I, I would argue it's probably not till another couple of years when Britain's famous foes enter the fray against them the French and the Spanish and the Dutch and so on, until people realise that the tide's probably going to go against them. I think that's a really good contextual appreciation of what's going on. But I'm going to take you um, now to your first scene. You picked a very specific day, which is the 10th of December, 1776. And you want to go to the old Somerset House in London. What's happening there? So 10th of December is the night of the annual lecture in the Royal Academy. The inaugural president of the Royal Academy is getting prepared to give his seventh address. I was pleased to see that I could find actually uh, weather records for 10th of December that all suggest that it's a particularly cold and rough oh, that sounds uh, good. winter night. Uh, as my British friends would say, that as a whinging Australian, um, I could just easily guess that the 10th of December <laughs> would be a bad night, but I do actually have records to show that it was a bit of a rough night. Good. And it felt like a rough winter, I think, to everyone going there. So when I imagine that scene, I imagine people running up the stairs, they want to maybe lose themselves in this one moment of appreciation of art, think about what their president is telling them, President Joshua Reynolds, um, and maybe not think about the kind of the catastrophe that's happening. And you say this is old Somerset House, it's just the same site as the new Somerset House that we're familiar with today on the Strand. That's right, on the Strand, yes. It was just unrenovated at this point. And it was a little bit ramshackle, being an old royal palace. The renovation started on this place just a few years after 1736. Okay, and they're a bit of an 
an event, aren't they, these presidential addresses? How long have they been going for by this point? By this point, so the Academy had been set up end of 68, so this is his seventh annual address. Mm. This was Joshua Reynolds' idea that he would give an annual address. It wasn't sort of written into the constitution, but he liked doing this once a year. Tell us a little bit about Joshua Reynolds. What kind of person was he and what did he mean to to Londoners at this time? So he's quite famous by this time. He probably is seen to be the most famous portrait painter in London and by extension in Britain at this point. I'm particularly interested in him. I've just written a book about three different lives and he's one of the lives that I've traced. So I traced him from quite modest beginnings in Plymouth or near Plymouth. Um, He'd come up to London in the early 1740s to have an apprenticeship. He'd managed to wrangle a grand tour, which was generally not quite his class, but through certain connections, he'd gone to a grand tour on Italy. By 1776, he's the undisputed leader of neoclassical adaptation for 18th century Britain. And that's his main theme in his lectures. Um, He's part of this rising middling set who are trying to very gently kind of leverage aristocratic patronage without looking too crass and kind of middle class themselves. And are you a fan of Reynolds? Are you sympathetic towards him? Um, I'm sympathetic towards him as a persona. I think he's quite an interesting kind of um, quite a mysterious person. I think he probably had quite conflicted intimate life. I, I certainly think that He's unusually kind of homosocial as as far as I could probably pinpoint it. I don't think I could say anything more else about his personal life. But um, certainly Joshua Reynolds is someone that intrigues me the most because of his interesting words, the way that he lived. And people certainly listened to Reynolds, didn't they? What did he tell them that night? That night he kind of begins in his usual frame, which is to say the point of art is to capture the universal kind of essence of humankind. I'm always kind of go for the general truths, not the particular truths. Don't get caught up in this trap of having to paint the likeness of your sitter. Always go for a depiction of the sitter that would suggest something grand about human nature. Most of the people in the audience would be familiar with that message. But interestingly, that night, and this is why I'm interested in this particular lecture, he does raise this obviously unspoken question that a lot of people in the room would have had, which is, what do you do, though, with someone who might sit in front of you who looks really actually very different from you, that actually reminds you of the diversity of human experience, not the sameness and that we're all universally the same. And the two examples that he brings up, say, for example, a Cherokee and say, for example, a Tahitian, what would an artist do when you're confronted with those sitters? And his answer to that is quite unusual. I mean, really, according to his theory, he should say, you should just make them kind of a generic depiction of the exotic and just remind everyone that we're all part of the same human race. But he does actually at this point in his lecture go against that assumption and he says there are some bits that you could as an artist kind of show is different about them as long as they don't remind you too much of human diversity. So, for example, in the Cherokee, if you wanted to paint the ochre on their cheeks, that would be fine. It's just a little sign. Every society has certain customs. He also says, though, you shouldn't paint aspects of human difference, such as a Tahitian tattoo, because that would be emphasising difference too much, something about the indelible nature of a tattoo would be something that you shouldn't actually show. So that's an interesting kind of little caveat that he introduces into mm. his general theory. And I think it might have woken up some of the student artists in the room by thinking, oh, here's a little important qualification to his general theory. Yeah, and I suppose thinking about that, does it suggest that there's a lot of new things coming into London which aren't necessarily familiar? Is that what's happening in 1770? That's right, that's right. It wasn't completely out of uh, you know, outlandish for Reynolds to have chosen the Cherokee and a Tahitian to use as his examples because everyone in the room that night would have known that Reynolds himself had just painted the portrait of a visiting Pacific Islander called Mai. Reynolds' painting of him had just been up in the same room just a few months beforehand. And most people would have remembered that about a dozen years before that, a Cherokee visitor had come along to London called Ostinaco. He was almost as famous as Mai, although he's not remembered so much today as being as famous. Reynolds had, in fact, also painted a portrait of him, but he hadn't liked that portrait. The students in the room wouldn't have known that he'd painted both of those people, but Reynolds, that's what he was speaking from experience. So it's a definite, what should we say, insight into Reynolds's method. And I want to dwell a little bit on Mai and Ostinaco, who are these yeah. two characters. Are they unusual visitors? Are, are we getting a stream of different people coming from exotic places? I'll use that word because that's probably the contemporary way people were thinking. Mai is the first Pacific Islander to go to Britain. But that said, of course, London is quite ethnically rich. There's certainly dark faces on the streets, but not necessarily 
indigenous peoples of the new world. So would half the attraction of Somerset House on this particular night be watching the, the reaction of the audience as much as listening to the words that Reynolds is saying? Yes, if I think of myself um, as in, in, the, in the darkened corner as you began, yes, I definitely would have been interested to see their faces. I think that they would have been nodding along because they would have remembered that both of these visitors, a Cherokee and a, and a Pacific Islander, had been hugely popular kind of urban events. There, there had been you know, minor celebrities in London. So they would have been nodding along I think, and remembering that they had come to London. I think that they would have, though, been, in, been curious to see how Reynolds himself was going to tackle it. So I think mm. a little bit of uh, probably a sense of recognition, but a little bit of curiosity about how this famous theorist of human universality was going to talk about these two mm. people. So in a way, you've got this nice contrast between a very familiar setting for Londoners, of course, which is a cold December right. night, <laughs> and this idea of talking about worlds far away where things were very different and quite, I suppose there's a, a sense of possibility at this time and yeah. there's a sense of the unknown. And we're going to go almost simultaneously. So this is the same date and this is the great thing about your choices is that it's still the 10th of December. Yep. But we're going to travel across the Atlantic. Where are we going to go to? We're going to go to Ostinaco's home country in the Carolinas and the Southern Appalachian Mountains. Ostinaco had been to Britain sort of, what, uh, 14 years before this now? He'd made it back from his journey in 1762. He'd made it back to Cherokee country and it had a pretty rough 14 years, it has to be said. He was a Cherokee leader. It's not a strictly hierarchical society, so there's numerous leaders, but he had been one of the most important leaders and negotiators. And he'd spent the last 14 years negotiating with British settlers about land and trying to hold back the tide of settlers. British imperial officials had understood what he was saying. They weren't necessarily successful in helping him holding the line, but they had understood and they had tried to negotiate until the 1770s when a new kind of brand of British settlers is now about land and trying to hold back the tide of settlers, pushing this, this idea of, of land um, far more aggressively. And they're generally the settlers who turn into revolutionaries. So that's the historical setting. Tell us a little bit about Ostinaco as a person. What have you been able to find out about him in general? In general, I think he's born about seventeen tens, so he's kind of um, an older man by so an older man, yeah, yeah um, by seventeen seventy six, certainly edging towards sixty or so. One of the reasons why I think he's a perfect subject for my history of for understanding Cherokee life in the eighteenth century is that his life pretty much spanned the British presence in the Carolinas. So in his youth, the British start kind of intruding into Cherokee land. And on the whole, they are, the, the British are quite unsuccessful in making any claims as the Cherokee who successfully hold them back. There are some violent periods, particularly 1760 Anglo-Cherokee War, and Ostinaco had been a key um, protagonist in that and uh, fiercely fighting against the British. However, you know, even though that was a year or two of strong aggression against the British, he had, over his long life, negotiated sometimes, you know, in a friendly way with certain British colonists and sometimes against them. So there's, there's no way that you could sort of pinpoint him as an ally or a foe. He just had to make the negotiations that were necessary for an Indigenous people facing such an onslaught. It was at the end of that Cherokee War that he'd gone to Britain to kind of secure the peace. Mm. How do you think the other Cherokee viewed Ostinaco as someone who'd gone away and come back? Did they see him as strangely altered? Do you think? Fortunately, I think for Ostanako, uh, there had been a precedent. Another Cherokee had gone generation beforehand um, called Atakula Kula, and he was Ostanako's contemporary. And both Atakula Kula and Ostanako survive and become elder statesmen all the way through the revolutionary era. So I think the Cherokee knew that their own people could cross seas and come back again. One of the things I like to talk about is that even though in Britain, someone like Ostanako looks extremely exotic and they must have thought that this was a brand new thing for Cherokees to do. Cherokees, of course, had had decades by now of diplomacy, or actually centuries of diplomacy with other peoples, if they were just other native peoples. So when Ostinaco comes back from London, he probably just would have been seen as someone who'd just been on another diplomatic mission, mm. trying to renegotiate land, constantly do the kind of maintenance of Cherokee sovereignty. And that gives us a real, I suppose, a, a good sense of him and his, his situation at the time. But what was happening in particular on the 10th of December that makes you want to go and see Ostinaco? So in December 76, um, it's actually a pretty rough winter, much more rough for the Cherokees even than, than for the British. They had tried to resist the revolutionary altercations of 1775. They just kind of considered it, you know, British civil war. 
But by 1776, they had, or a faction of the Cherokees, had been brought into the Revolutionary War. And the faction that had been brought in were the younger Cherokees, and not Ostanako's kind of peer group, because they had just felt that the older Cherokees were just ceding too much land. And what happens, unfortunately, is that the Revolutionary Force just brings in men from all over, from Virginia, from Georgia, from everywhere. So they have a horrible fight through the summer of 76, um, where the Cherokees are pretty much outnumbered six to one. And so the older Cherokees have to step in by that winter to wrangle a peace agreement, um, even though they hadn't been the ones who really wanted to have that battle. What's interesting to me is that Ostinaco in December is clearly just, I mean, it's thin evidence, but uh, just from retrospective evidence, we know that he was clearly having a bit of an existential moment, kind of mm. thinking through what to do. It was sort of part of his job to secure a peace treaty with the revolutionaries, but he did have a huge sympathy for the younger Cherokees' mm. view that actually they shouldn't surrender. So he's trying to negotiate and think about what to do. Yeah, and I think this is a situation you often find in moments of conflict when people have to decide, obviously, what side they're on or how far they're willing to go in terms of resistance. Yeah. And is he a key figure in the decision-making process among the Cherokee, do you think? He is a key figure, and what they come up with that winter is that come the spring, the Cherokees will sign two separate peace treaties, one with the northern lying revolutionaries and then one with the southern lying revolutionaries. And Ostinaco goes along to, this, I think it's the northern treaty, and he signs that. You can see his signature on the colonial papers and he's supposed to turn up to the southern one but he doesn't appear and this is into about June 77 by this point and the revolutionary settlers they they're expecting him specifically because they know that he's very important that if he says that there's going to be a peace then it would have proper reverberations and they wait around for days but he never shows so what they do is they go ahead and sign a treaty with the older Cherokees minus Ostinaco which is a peace between the, the American Revolution and the Cherokee people but what Ostanako has done six months after this December kind of moment of the night is that he has gone over to the younger set. Ah. So later historians have called this a secessionist movement, that these are, you know, young Cherokees have gone over and they've gone further west. Um, they're sometimes called the Chickamaugas, different kind of name. But I think that Ostanako himself, plus all of his younger kind of comrades, would have insisted on calling themselves still the Cherokees. And what right. they had done was to say, we are going to try and maintain Cherokee customs no longer through land, because that is now gone. It's a, it's a vanished dream, but we can try and reestablish Cherokee life and try and hold true by recreating a, a Cherokee society further west and never surrendering to the revolution. So really, this is a, a massively important moment then yeah. here, right, with Austin Arco in the December, because he has obviously got this inner conflict of what he's going to do. How I um, appreciate it is that really, to me, for him to say, I'm moving west, I'm not going to negotiate anymore with the British loyalists who still want my military help. I am going back to my own indigenous centred world and I'm going to try and carve out this world that no longer has this kind of constant process of negotiation, which had basically characterised most of his life. Mm. So I like to think of it not as this sort of um, withdrawal, which of course in the long term looks like it's got a pretty bleak kind of destiny, um, but in the short term it's an amazing moment of refusal for engagement um, and no longer to be on British or white terms. So I get the sense that you'd almost be looking at him with a bit of admiration here. This, yeah. is, this is someone who's making a difficult decision, but is really staying true to themselves. Yeah, definitely. And I think that that kind of, it was certainly inspirational to his own younger kin, but generations on, I think he stands as an inspiring kind of example to later Native Americans who have to look back on a pretty grim history, yeah. but can find moments of resistance and actually kind of indigenously centred and maintained worlds, which is really right. important to remember. And thanks to Joshua Reynolds, who at this mm. moment is speaking in London, we yeah. know from earlier on, or at least preparing to go out. We know what Ostinaco looks like. Could you just we give do. us a bit of a description of him? What was he? What was he like in person? We do. Um, one of the things that um, intrigues me about Reynolds' portrait of Ostinaco is that Reynolds didn't like it, and he covered it up and didn't let anyone see it, which right. makes me think that Reynolds thought it was a failure. And we know that Reynolds didn't subscribe to this idea that portraits should be like. Yeah, you know, they shouldn't be just necessarily good photographic representations. Yeah. Unlike some of his other contemporaries who did think that was their job. So. Um, my speculation is that one of the reasons why he doesn't like this portrait is because it's actually too like. It actually right. does look like Ostinaco. And when you do look at it, it's quite, um, it, as a portrait, it's a quite uh, um, disturbing, might be too strong a word, but it, is, it does make you contemplate 
the idea that this is um, someone who's come over to London to look the British right in the eye and say, you know, this far and no more. You, mm. Your empire has got out of control. So if a you're sense taking of defiance. Away. A sense of defiance, I think, is captured in his expression. Also in the portrait, he does look like an older man. I guess he was 40 at the time, and he does, I suppose, look, look about that. He, um, he's got a mixture of, I think, probably what he authentically may have been wearing. He's got a Cherokee headdress. Some, uh, he's got a Cherokee kind of gorget as a sign of temporary friendship with the British. He's also got some odd bits of European clothing, which Reynolds probably kind of created around him. So he's a bit of a mixture that way. But what's most important to me is his facial expression. It's a nice, quiet stare of defiance, mm. which I think Reynolds would have been interested in. But I think as a portraitist of the empire, he couldn't actually afford to mm. put out there in public. So let's leave him there. Yep. And let's go on to your third scene, which is, again, same time. So mm -hmm. we're simultaneously painting history. Yep. And we are, we're halfway across the Indian Ocean, midway between Cape Town and Tasmania. Yeah. What are we looking at now? Where are we? So we're on what I would call a smallish boat. You, Peter Moore, as having written about Endeavour, probably wouldn't have thought it was that small. But um, if I was hiding in a corner at this point, I would be absolutely terrified and wet and cold and seasick. Um, we call him Mai. Um, he's from Raiatea. He's often known by British historians as Omai, oh and he has been in Britain for two years at this point. And he'd come with Cook's second voyage. Now he's going home with Cook's third voyage. So uh, the similarities here between Ostinaco and Mai, in the sense that they've both been taken from their, their homelands and they've travelled to London and they've experienced the empire from the very heart. Um, why is Mai going home? Was it not? Was he not having too much of a good time of it in London? Why? Why was he going back? Um, <laughs> he had always assumed that he would go back, and so did the British. They they, they thought it was going to be problematic to have, bring people over from the New World and not make sure that they uh, could could be. And he was homed. just. Why did he join in the first place? It might be interesting just to. Yeah. So he he joined on Cook's second voyage. He actually had met Cook's first voyage, mm. although. Um, and when they came round again in 1773, took the opportunity to jump on board because he knew that he wanted to go back to wherever these mm. British people had come from because he'd seen over the last few years various Europeans visit his homelands around the Tahitian archipelago and seen their quite incredible firepower. The reason why he was interested in British firepower was because he himself was a refugee living on a different island in the Tahitian archipelago. He was originally from Raiatea, which is a sacred island in the middle of the archipelago, but he'd been ousted along with his family and a whole bunch of Raiataeans in the 1760s when they had been invaded by a different indigenous group, the Bora Borans. So his interest in weaponry is because one day he wants to stage an act of vengeance it's against... power, isn't it? He's yeah. seen the yeah. power and he wants a piece yeah. of it. and reclaim Raiatea. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so he's spent his time in London for a couple of years. And Mai was a real celebrity, wasn't he? Yeah, he really was a big celebrity. I mean, that said, I, I do want to emphasize that probably Ostinaco and some other New World people had been as famous, but now we remember Mai. How were the they treated famous. in London? Well, London or even Britain at large? Yeah, Did so they go round? Yeah, so Mai goes all over Britain. He goes all the way up to Whitby and down to Plymouth, Portsmouth. He travels quite a lot. The reason why he travels so much is because his escort is Joseph Banks, who's a great traveler around Britain. He and I have to say most New World people in in Britain in the 18th century have a reasonably good time if they can survive the germ issues. And my did survive it because Banks made sure that he was inoculated against smallpox. The, the history that we might be aware of, of putting New World people or exotic people up for spectacle is much more of a 19th century tradition. Mm. And that is certainly... So, and this is an then. important point just maybe to stress. He wasn't being taken around like a caged beast no. for display. He no, had his not. own freedom Abs of movement and absolutely. agency. Absolutely. Yep, certainly. I mean, probably we, we think of the way that Banks thought about him in possibly um, paternalistic, maybe condescending ways, mm. but certainly not thinking of him as a spectacle. The reason why the Admiralty was keen for Banks to do this and to look after him is because they know that they've had a long history, 200-year history, of one day having to cultivate an Indigenous broker if one day you want to create a treaty. Mm. So I think that the reason why they're interested in hosting Mai and making sure that he has a decent diplomatic time is because one day they may have their imperial sites on the Pacific so here we see the imperial diplomacy in action. And again, I keep thinking of these similarities between Austin Arco, who's yeah. who seems much more of a diplomat, actually, than yeah. Mai. Yeah. Um, is that right? Yeah, Osanako definitely thinks of himself as a, as a diplomat. Mai is no, no interest whatsoever in being a diplomat and not thinking about treaties at all. 
But that doesn't mean that the British government don't think, oh, maybe he could be one day the, mm. the guy that we come back to find and then try and um, negotiate a treaty with. So well, I'm a very strange ambassador to the to the Pacific Islands. My, that seems... Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But increasingly, he had been asking banks, you know, really the main point I'm here is to get weapons. So what about the weapons? And, uh, and Cook and Banks and everyone else around him keep on sort of deferring and kind of putting him off on that question. Certainly by the last six months, he's pretty, uh, Banks is busy doing other things. He's sort of living on his own just with one kind of um, assistant. Uh, and I think he is pretty bored. So I think he's ready to go home, ready for some warmer weather as well. We know that this voyage ended badly for Cook. He's not going to come back from the Pacific. But can you tell us a little bit about what happened to Mai? How did he fare after his return? So he does make it all the way back to the Tahitian archipelago, but as he's nearing his home, he's begging Cook to say, now remember, I want to go back to Raiatea. This is where my homeland is, and I want you to hand over the weapons that I've been waiting for for two years. Cook at the last minute realises that he doesn't want to hand him back to that specific island. He realises that there is a, a, a war going on there and he doesn't want to get the British involved. Um, so disappointingly for Mai, he gets placed back on a on a midway island called Huhini and Cook hands over the big box of goods that Banks had given him. So Mai is very excitedly rips it open, expecting lots of muskets and cannons maybe, uh, and he, what he finds is pretty disappointing. There's a little bit of guns and whatnot, some ammunition, probably quite damp at this point, and a whole bunch of other just absolutely rubbish stuff that Banks kind of thought would be fun, I guess, including a jack-in-the-box, some cutlery, an umbrella, some dresses for ladies, uh, some porcelain plates, pretty disappointing stuff for someone who is wanting to then stay. So does he feel a sense of claim. betrayal? Do you he think? does feel pretty disappointed, and he's, and he's begging Cook to say, this is not going to help me, so maybe you and your officers could actually be the arms to help me reclaim. Mm. And Cook says, no, this is, not my, this is not my war. I don't want to get involved. We've got to leave you here, mm. and he's moving off. There's an interesting scene that a lot of historians talk about the last moment when Mai says goodbye to Cook and everyone records that Mai breaks down in tears and cries. And most officers at the time, and I have to say a lot of historians ever since, have interpreted that as Mai's devastation at having, having to say goodbye to the British. But once you realise that he's only just opened up that crate and he realises he's not going to get back to Raiatea, I think those tears could mean something a bit different. I think that's a really a really poignant place to leave this because what we've got in common between all of these scenes um, that happened on the 10th of December from the um, the Royal Academy and you've got the the Ostinaco and the Cherokee and Mai in the middle of the Pacific, you've got this process of empire and the idea of new things and how relationships should really be constructed and maintained. And you can see here that it's not always going to be an easy story. And mm -hmm. I think what we see here yeah, is the process of colonialism and how very small people at an individual level are brought yeah. into this decision-making process and yeah. how it's a question of power, really, isn't it? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your book. Is this what you've tried to do? Bring these stories together and try and make sense of this particular moment. What range of years do you look at in the book? So in tracing three biographies, it helped me look at three very different places in the 18th century world, but all tied together in unexpected ways by British imperialism. So I've got one last question to throw at you before we uh, before we go home. Mm -hmm. If you could bring one memento back from your time travels to the present day, what would you like to bring? Oh my goodness! Um, I'm gonna let you have a think about that for a minute if you like. If this I could is have, for our cabinet of curiosity. If I could have two, I would take both of the Reynolds paintings, but that might be um, insurance wise a bit problematic, and I'm sure <laughs> there'd be lots of lots of, uh, of pushback on that. Mm. It would also make me extremely wealthy at this point. <laughs> but yeah, that would be that would be wonderful to look at both of those um, pictures and to remember all the three men behind them well that's i think a pretty brilliant travel we now know the 10th of december 1776 pretty well in a very panoramic sort of way as well from the strand to america and then onto the indian ocean and it's intriguing to think about all of these things happening simultaneously so thank you for telling us all about them kate and the very best of luck with your book which is called the warrior the Voyager and the Artist, and it's going to be published by Yale University Press later on this year. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you, Peter. I'm Paul Lay, the editor of History Today, and on our website you'll find articles written by experts relating to Kate Fullagos podcast. You can read Claudia Rogers on the people who discovered Christopher Columbus, 
Andrea Severson on Taming Pocahontas, or Daryl Bates on The Abyssinian Boy. Links to all of these pieces can be found at www.historytoday forward slash travels. And of course, there are many more articles on every aspect of the past to be found in History Today, the world's leading serious history magazine.